Okay, now we'll have the coordinator of the watch, Alejandra Morena, to present the content of the watch of this year. Thank you, Flavio, for the introduction, and thank you all for being here. Uh, we're very happy to see so many of you at, this, at the international launch of the seventh edition of the Right to Food and Nutrition Watch. I do hope you enjoyed the video. And now, as the coordinator of the watch, I would like to share the key messages and findings of this year's edition. But first of, first of all, please allow me to thank everyone who has contributed to this edition of the watch. As Flavio mentioned, it's the result of a collaborative process. So I would like to highlight especially the contributions and insights of all the authors and the editorial board members. Some of them are present here today, so I would like to thank them for their, for their support. And also do hope that they will be able to provide further inputs in the discussion section of this event. Also, um, our gratitude to the proofreaders, editors, everyone involved, also my colleague Rafael Loe at Fin International. We work closely together in, in, in coordinating this, this publication. So now moving on to the content of the Watch 2014. As Flavia mentioned, uh, it is dedicated to marking the 10th uh, year anniversary of the Right to Food Guidelines. And as such, it contributes to the assessment of, of what has happened over the past decade in the fight for the right to food, to adequate food and nutrition. We looked at the areas of progress and also identified the key uh, obstacles and challenges for the future. So the watch does contribute to this process initiated by civil society to, to take stock on this anniversary. But the watch 2014 also covers a very broad range of, of key issues and policy processes that are very relevant right now. We have, for example, articles uh, concerning the upcoming second international uh, conference on nutrition. We also have an article on the principles for agriculture and investment, which will be addressed next week at the CFS. We are covering also the impact of climate change and of procratic crisis on, food, uh, on the right to food, on food security, on food sovereignty. We also address the links between women's sexual and reproductive rights and the right to adequate food and food security. And as we always do in the watch, we have case studies and concrete examples uh, of social mobilization from countries and regions around the world. So obviously, I would like to encourage you to, uh, uh, to take a look uh, at, the, at the publication and to take as many copies as you wish to share with your colleagues. But I would like now to very briefly outline some of the key messages. Um, in terms of progress, the watch reveals that the right to food guidelines uh, this consensus uh, document adopted 10 years ago, uh, ago by the governments, the guidelines have contributed to increasing the visibility and understanding of food as a human right. They emphasize the obligations of states and the role of rights holders, and they very importantly stress the need to adopt a holistic approach to food and food systems. So this is a major contribution of the guidelines. They have also contributed to initiating the process of the incorporation of the right to food into national policy and legal frameworks around the world. And now we see the right to food incorporated in the constitutions and through framework laws in countries around the world. The watch shows that this is an ongoing process with examples from the Philippines and Belgium, just uh, to name a few. Also, the, the guidelines have been used by civil society as a monitoring tool to monitor right to food policies at the national level, as shown by the example of Colombia in the Watch 2014. And we also see now, and this is an important uh, development, is that the right to food is being claimed as a justiciable right at courts in some countries around the world, even though there's still progress needed. This is a positive development. And the watch shows a landmark case of uh, children malnutrition in Guatemala, on where the right to food has been uh, found to be violated. So one thing that becomes clear in the watch uh, this year, as well as in the previous editions, is that the role of civil society and social movements and rights holders is key in uh, ensuring the implementation of accountability for the right to food. Uh, in the watch, we see, for example, how uh, peasants have joined in a coalition in Mali to uh, resist to the, to the trend of land grabbing. But we see that this is a trend around, around the world. And we can say that the right to food and other economic, social, and cultural rights are not a cornerstone in the struggles of groups fighting for the rights around the world. We have a rights holders group fighting for their land, for the territory, for water, 
for seeds, for gender equality, for food sovereignty. And all of these are coming together with human rights and the right to adequate food and food sovereignty as a unifying factor. However, the picture is, is very mixed. As, as you all know, there's major challenges ahead. And the implementation of the right to food and the right to food guidelines remains deficient. We can say that the right to food is probably, is arguably the the most systematically violated human right around the world. And this happens in most cases with total impunity and no accountability. So there's a need to, to, <laughs> to do much more with the guidelines. Um, and the factors that explain why this is, uh, why the situation uh, comes about are revealed in the watch um, in many of the articles. They're related to power relations and the exclusion and marginalization of rights holders and social movements. We see a lack of actual and real political will by states to fully recognize and effectively implement the right to food and the right to food guidelines. We see there's a huge policy incoherence in many areas. We see policies in the areas of energy, trade, ag food, agriculture that are adopted, uh, that are not coherent with the right to food and human rights, and that are not uh, adopted with the participation of those most affected by hunger. Um, and this needs to change. Uh, we all agree that the, the, all the contributors of the watch agree on this. Uh, a further concerning trend that we see in the watch uh, revealed is the um, increasing control of the corporate sector over food systems and natural resources. Uh, we see how land, water, and other natural resources are being increasingly under control uh, from, the from the corporate sector. I mentioned the case of uh, land grabbing in Mali, but this is not only affecting the global south, but also the global north. And you can see a very interesting article in the watch on the impact of mining and extractive industries or indigenous populations and um, farmers in Sweden. Um, so obviously this, this, this issue of, of grabbing of resources very often leaves them, leads to the displacement and eviction of the communities from their lands. They, leave, they cannot sustain their livelihoods and the right to food is violated. And uh, a parallel trend that we see is that there is an increasing influence uh, being gained by the corporate sector in public policy spaces in areas such as nutrition, health and, and, and trade. So in this context, um, the contributors of the watch make a series of demands, and this is very much linked to the, some of the points that Flavio mentioned in his introduction. They're calling for a promotion of a sustainable agroecological uh, model of agriculture and a human rights-based approach to ending uh, poverty and to food policies. They're calling for more democratic food systems and inclusive governance that ensures that those most affected by hunger are included in decisions that affect their lives and natural resources. And here we're talking about small pro scale producers, including peasants, uh, fisher folk, pastoralists, indigenous peoples, women, youth, agricultural food workers, and many more. They should be at the center of decision making. They're also calling for strong monitoring accountability mechanisms to ensure that states and other powerful actors do not violate and abuse the uh, human right to adequate food and nutrition with impunity. And they're finally calling on this anniversary of this very important document for a renewed commitment from governments, UN agencies, and other stakeholders to implement the right to food guidelines and for the full realization of the right to adequate food and nutrition for all. So this is very briefly some of the, some of the points that are highlighted in, this, in the Watch 2014. As I mentioned, I do encourage you to take a look. And I do hope that our colleague here will complement this presentation. And yeah, thank you for your attention.